We're studying in the book of Ephesians, and we've just uh, we had kind of an introduction on Life Sunday. We're going to go ahead and get into the first chapter this morning as we, uh, in our study, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer, and uh, I'll lead us in that prayer. Our holy God and Father, we come before you, the God of glory, the one who is the creator and the sustainer of all, the gracious one who is our redeemer and blesses us with every spiritual blessing. Be with us this morning as we open the book of Ephesians and study what you have shared with us. May we be encouraged by this and may we build our hope in this. These things we pray in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> the book of Ephesians, as we mentioned uh, last Sunday, as we have here noted in the first verse, was written by the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul had initially visited Ephesus and, uh, on his second missionary journey. He stopped and, and stayed a while in Ephesus before he went back to Jerusalem, then to Antioch. He comes back as a first part of his third missionary journey, stops in Ephesus and spends about three years there teaching the gospel in Ephesus. Apparently, they had a very successful spread of the gospel conversion of people from idolatry to uh, faith in Jesus Christ because it disturbed or upset the idol trade. And so at the, uh, near the end of Paul's stay there, uh, and, uh, after the three years, they have a riot in Ephesus, and, a big, and Paul decides that he needs to leave and go somewhere else. This leaves to me a couple of things with the church. The gospel was very successful there in Ephesus, but there became this opposition which necessitated Paul to leave. Paul leaves and he's gone from Ephesus about five years when we understand he writes this letter. Paul, based on what it says about being in chains, we believe he's in prison. We believe he was in prison at Rome and writes this letter back to Ephesus. I think some of the concerns that may have been in Paul's mind is that here we've got a group of Christians that I haven't been able to be with. He knows that they're faithful based upon verse 15 down here uh, in the first chapter, but he's concerned that something might pull them away from Christ. The book of Ephesians is not written uh, containing any kind of corrections that they need to make, but rather it is completely a letter about faith in God and God's grace for us and how we can build our faith in God. And so here we, we have a picture of a church that has, you know that five years that Paul was gone, the temple of Diana didn't go away. The opposition from the silversmiths didn't go away. So the opposition to Christianity did not go away in that five years and the turmoil it was causing did not go away. And so I see Paul writing this letter to try and build their hope in Christ, to solidify their hope in Christ so that their faith stays firm in Christ. And two, another topic we're going to see in this letter is to draw them together with each other in love. And we, we have that thought expressed uh, several times in the book, to draw together in love or being together in love. So in a way, I want to bring that to us contemporary as we're going through the book of Ephesians. We've come through a year, 18 months of uh, social distress, I guess we would say, with this pandemic. It's had a tendency to create fear and to draw us apart or separate us into our own quarters and isolate us from each other. So some of the closeness that we had before the pandemic seems to have been drawn apart by the fear, by the conflicts, and the, the various things that have gone on over the last 18 months. Uh, and so what I think the book of Ephesians would, is going to be particularly good for us to see what Paul taught those people who had, were experiencing fears and conflicts uh, by their society in which they live, how they could solidify their faith, how they could build their faith in God, 
and, and, and their love for each other. Uh, you know, two words, that, or there's several word combinations we're going to see in the book of Ephesians. One of those is grace and peace. Paul begins almost every letter that he writes to a church with the, with the words grace and peace. Those are the two most significant words in our relationship with God. God extends his grace to us through Jesus Christ, and we have a relationship of peace with God. Paul doesn't just throw these words in there to, uh, to fill space. That's what is significant is that we can have, God gives us his grace, and therefore we can be at peace with God. That's what we need more than in a world of conflict and turmoil where we're aware of our shortcomings and our sins, we know we need grace. And we need, know we need a relationship with God. And for them, that is in contrast with going down to Diana's temple and worshiping, because that's the draw for them, is to go to Diana's temp, Diana temple. What Paul is, God is offering is grace and peace. The two other words that are a pair of words I think are extremely significant in the book of Ephesians, we're gonna to wanna to come across these, are faith and love. Now, I think that describes how we build our relationship with each other. Grace and peace relates to our relationship with God. Faith and love relates to our relationship with each other. Now, it, it relates to God but it builds our relationship with each other. And we're going to see several times Paul is going to discuss topics or threads to talk about our faith in God and our love for God and each other and how we are building ourselves into one. So I think those are, are kind of the primary goals of the book of Ephesians. And I hope for us to look for these as we go through the book of how it's God and, and it's God's grace and peace we have because of that. That is something we can have that's precious and God is offering to us. And it's the faith in God and our faith in each other and love that builds us into unity as a group of oneness. And that's, I think that's what they needed. I think that's what we needed. He's writing here to a group of people who have faith in God, but he wants to build that faith uh, in, in the book of Ephesians. Okay, kind of a, just a overall background there uh, to begin with. It's written by the apostle uh, Paul. He, uh, in verse one, he talked about being the apostle by the will of God. If you think back to Dempsey's class Wednesday night and he had the board out here and he drew those circles, he had God, he had Jesus, the apostles, that that is a line of commission. God made the choice and made, uh, Paul didn't come in one day and raise his hand and says, I want to be an apostle. We remember that story on the road to Damascus. Paul was anything but an apostle, but God stopped him in his tracks because God knew he could use him and made him apostle. So now Paul takes his apostleship very seriously. That means he's one who speaks the word of God from God, which gives it its authority and its credibility. Not because Paul speaks it, because the authority comes from God through Paul's speech. Paul himself, if we look at, uh, at how he views himself, he views himself as a sinner who needs the grace of God. He does not view himself as the great authority. No, he's been entrusted with the gospel. And so the only reason, he, I think the reason he mentioned he's an apostle his apostleship has the authority. Paul does not himself. But here he is apostle by the will of God. God selected him and sent him out with his, his teaching. I think that's important for us to see from the very beginning that this is a message that's come from God through an apostle for us. And this is, uh, I think, what Paul is doing here. Now, in, in the second part of that verse, the message is to the saints. It speaks of them who, and we talked about this a little Wednesday, but in and the New American Standard reads the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Jesus Christ. This is not an evangelistic book. 
Not that evangelism cannot be taught from this book. This, uh, this, is, not, this is a book about people who already believe in Jesus Christ and trying to move them forward in their faith. This book is written to us just as much as it was to the Ephesians. Uh, the church at Ephesus or circulated to Laodicea and the other churches of Asia. This is directed to us. So this is a, a letter of encouragement because of uh, uh, who it's addressed, uh, addressed to. So I want us to think, of, think about that. These are people who are already faithful in the Lord. So it's a letter to, as I say, to solidify them and to build them up and to move them forward. So with that, I want to make a couple of thoughts here. As we go through this book and we see Paul saying things such as, husband, you need to treat your wife right. We need to think back about that, how that's going to build my faith up. Children, you need to submit to uh, your parents. Think about how that's going to, that shows or is going to build me up as a Christian because that's the purpose of this book is to build us up as Christians, our faith in the Lord, and we can go, go through the, to me, the, the, a whole latter part of the book is we had, these are not just things that were some good thing that Paul wrote down. These are things driving toward the very purpose of building faith in individuals. And if we implement these things in our lives, it will build our faith. If we don't implement them, we keep watching Diana, our faith is going to dwindle, or we keep worrying about the things that are oppressing us, then our faith is going to dwindle. It's only when we turn to God and see his instruction and implement that in our lives will we build our faith. And so that's how I hope we as, as Christians can approach this book. It's a message from God to us as Christians, and if we do these things, we'll be built up. Any thoughts here before we go any further? And went too much talking this morning. Depsy? Yes, sir, to your really good point that you just made there, that all of the reflection uh, on our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, whether it's the family, it's the you know, workplace, it's our relationship with one another, it's all a reflection of, of the faith that we have in, in the Lord and a growth of faith, hopefully, and Paul. He really supports that idea whenever we're talking about the home, the husband wife relationship, he'll say, now, This mystery is great, but I'm speaking in reference to Christ and the earth. Right. You know, it, it, the, the main point is that relationship. Okay, and, I, and uh, when you, we, I've always struggled with my complete or my understanding of that statement, and I'm glad you brought it up, Dempsey. Because I think that is probably a, an explanation of that. We think these are just rules to make a better marriage life. No, this is an instruction of how you can have a better relationship with God through implementing these things in your everyday life. And, and that's what, what I'm talking about is Christ and his church, his people. We're going to be united. We're going to be his people when we implement his teaching in our personal lives. And I think that's, that's what, uh, that's going to build us up. Now, the less we implement it, the more we're gonna struggle um, as, as Christians. Okay, uh, any other thoughts? Verse two, we've already talked about a little bit, grace and peace. We know that it is by God's grace, by his reaching out to us, his hand to us is the only way we're going to, and that's one of Paul's themes in the book of, uh, of Ephesians is God's grace, how it is, it is from God, it is of God, it is kindly intended for us, it is for us from God. So grace, God reaches out to us to have a peaceful relationship with him. And I, re I remember to me, this is reflective of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Whenever they have sinned, what is their first thought after they've sinned? Uh, 
I'm afraid. I'm afraid. And that's what generates fear in us in a relationship with God is our sin. So now we can have, God's going to extend his grace so we can have that peace. And that's uh, what, uh, so Paul uh, prays for that and, and wants that for them. Now, what we're going to see in verses 3 through 14. Yes, Eddie? You mentioned those four verses, two paragraphs right. of Jesus' faithful love. Of course, they're all mentioned very prominently here at the beginning. Right. And then at the end of the book, you're going to find those four words that make up the last two verses. Okay. And so it, it, it's all tied together. Paul starts with that, he ends with that, and everything ties together with this. Okay. Okay, and, and I appreciate that because this book, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's just one nice woven fabric is what I would call it. From beginning to end, he's a uh, book like 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, Paul has lots of uh, arrows he's got to shoot. He's got one train of thought in this book and he's moving forward with that to solidify our faith in Jesus Christ and to build that faith up. And I think uh, these four words are really key words for us in, in this book. And it seems that they run in those two pairs a lot of the times is uh, uh, grace and peace and faith and love. Okay, let's uh, go on here. Uh, in, in three through uh, 14, he's going to uh, talk about, or he's going to, pronounce a blessing or, or he's going to, I guess we could uh, thank God or praise God in the very first part of, of verse three. He says, blessed be God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul praises or blesses, places of blessing or a eulogy or, you know, is saying how great God is. He starts off with that. And again, I want to liken that as he doesn't contrast it here, but I think it has to be in our minds. That's contrasted with anything else that would draw our attention. For them, Diana and the temple. To us, things that, that draw us away from God. Blessed be God and the Father, they sit here. And then the reason he's going, he praises and bless God he, God himself, why is God so great? Why is, why is Paul blessing God or praising God? God has acted toward us. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing, and he's blessed us in Christ. I think these are going to be, and then he's going to develop the next few verses on these two thoughts. We're going to see that Everything that God does for us is in Christ. We're going to see that, we're going to see that statement repeated seven times in, uh, before we get to 13. It's going to be either in Christ or through Christ. We're going to see that repeated. Again, their mind and our mind needs to be focused upon there is nothing in a way of spiritual blessing I can get outside of Christ because he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, spiritual blessing, I want us to think about there for a moment in this. Paul does not in Ephesians deal with my physical blessings, my food, clothing, and shelter, and my physical health. That's not his primary concern. His primary concern is my relationship with God. And when we read that verse, we need to, need to see that is God has given us everything that relates to what? My physical well-being, my relationship to him. Now, my physical well-being is going to deteriorate. I'm going to die. I might suffer premature sickness as some of, uh, of our young people have. That is part of the this world that Satan's in charge of, but my relationship with God, he has given me everything for that relationship and for my salvation. He has also given me many physical blessings, but he has not given me everything to survive this world. I will not survive this world. 
I, th I think that's a, something we need to uh, keep in our minds. Paul focuses on our relationship with God through the book. So he, 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 God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Heavenly places is the idea of what? Pardon? Okay, being with God. All the realms above us, whatever there is, he has made available to us in Christ. And I, and I think that's a, extremely important for us. It's in Christ. Uh, God has made these available in Christ. The next uh, thought we're going to see here is in, uh, is in verse 4. He's going to now name seven things, or he's going to mention seven things that are in Christ. Uh, he chose us in him. Uh, I have to kind of uh, uh, taken uh, these, these verses that we go down through here. Paul has a main idea in the verse, and then he has lots of amplifying clauses on that idea. So I have picked out, and uh, this is Dan picking out what he, he sees as the main idea in the verse. And then he has, look, we want us to see how these clauses amplify what he has said in that verse. Uh, he said, he chose us in Christ and, uh, uh, and he chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless. Okay, two thoughts here. What do you get from the idea that he chose us before the foundation of the world? In Christ. Now he chose us in, he didn't just choose us he chose us in Christ. I want to keep that in our mind. That's his statement. He chose us in Christ. Pardon? What's it? the second line up there? Before the foundation of the world, he made this decision. What's that suggest to us? Okay, before the beginning even, right? Okay, that's one of our main lines of our spiritual heritage teaching. Uh, before the, what's that say about God? He knows everything, doesn't he? He can, he can make, he can foresee and make those decisions before creation ever existed. So that, that shows that God is infinite in his knowledge and his understanding. Now, what did he choose? I think this next line is extremely important for us. He chose us to be holy and blameless. I was talking with Chris, I guess it was last Sunday, and Chris shared something with me that uh, I think that uh, we all struggle with. Chris said he struggled with the idea that he could be holy in this life. Is that what, something like that, what you said, Chris? Okay, all right. Oh, sorry about that. But I think we do struggle looking at ourselves and our sin that I'm holy. Now we have, based on our faith in Jesus and what God has done for us, we see we can be holy. I think that we, we struggle with this concept that we can be holy and blameless. But that's what God, that's his promise of what he's going to do for us. Eddie? Why we struggle with that, and I certainly feel that too, is we know that we're not holy and blameless in ourselves, that we can't be. Okay. But that's where we have to understand what Paul was telling us is God is going to make us and has made us holy and blameless in Christ, huh. not in ourselves. Okay. And, and the reason we struggle with that, I think, is because do you remember any of your sins? Do you wish that you could live certain periods of your life over? But God, and, and so I, this, to me, this is one of the most important statements in the book. God determined before the world was created that he would make us holy and blameless. How did he create Adam and Eve? holy and blameless. 
That's God's desire for us, is to be whole and blameless. That's what Jesus is about. That's what redemption's about. So I, I think that's, to me, that's an important thought for us to see. He's going to make us holy and blameless. Not that I would, I'm still the God that sinned. But because of, we know we're going to go through this, there's going to be the forgiveness, there's going to be the redemption, there's the price is going to be paid. That's God's doing. It's not Dan Byers is doing. So he, he already had it developed how he could make each of us holy and blameless. Eddie? Okay. Okay. Thank you. That means we're standing before the throne of God and we are pure and clean as we do so. Okay. And that's very good. So it's not because of what I've done or that I continue to do, but it's because of what Jesus has done. Okay. That's great. Yeah, Mike? There's another issue, though, other than just the fact that we remember what we've done and we feel like, how can I be holy with all of that? All, all these things in my past, I think it's that we still continue to struggle with those things. And when we say that, you know, Jesus Christ, it's in Jesus Christ, and it's Jesus that, that makes us clean, not of ourselves, there's still this expectation that when you are washed in the blood of Christ, that you will then walk in a new life. And even to the extent that you give Jesus credit for that, say, I'm not doing this, I can only do this because Jesus and the blood of Christ, the Spirit of God, makes it possible for me. There's still an expectation that we will be a new creature. And then we look at ourselves and say, actually, I still feel a lot like the old creature. It feels like it didn't work, like it didn't pay, like it didn't work. You were given this new spiritual body, but it still wants to act like the old physical one. Okay. And what each of us struggles with that. But I think the book of Ephesians is addressed to how to move from that to be the new creature and we just studied 1 John recently. 1 John deals a lot with those ideas of how we can know that we are children of God. And I, I agree with you, Mike. That's, yes, Gary? I think, and, and help me here uh, uh, if I'm, you think I'm not right, I think the, this idea that uh, we can be completely forgiven and we can be holy, knowing how sinful we were, magnifies what God has done through Jesus. It should put that so at the forefront of our minds that we want Jesus with every fiber in our, in our spirit. And I think that's I think that's what we, and that's why I think a book such as Ephesians uh, builds us toward God, solidifies our faith in God, because knowing that we can be holy and blameless, the people that we are, again, uh, in him, in Christ, we can be that. So why would we leave Christ for Diana? Or the world. Okay. The next clause or phrase that he gives here, uh, is that he predestined us to adoption as sons. The uh, last Two words of verse four, there's a, and, and I've got a, a coupled with verse five here. 
Uh, the translators of the New American Standard thought they went with verse five because of the way they punctuated it. It can go with either verse, but I, I think that uh, to me, the thought is it, it goes better perhaps with uh, verse five. He predestined us to adoptions as sons. That relates back before the foundation of the world. Again, before time began, God determined something. We're going to talk a little bit about predestined in a minute, but we want to talk always in the context of what Paul is writing here. He is writing in the context of Christians who are in Christ. Because every phrase he uses, there's somewhere in Christ is, uh, or through Christ is, is in, this, in this section. In love, that's God's attitude toward us. In love, he determined that he would make me holy and blameless, or you holy and blameless in Christ. In love, he predestined that we could be adopted uh, as, uh, as sons. He, he determined that we could be sons and daughters. Now, we understand the idea of adoption and being sons and daughters is the idea that a person has all the privileges of a natural born child. Now, I'll just pick on Amanda over here, Adam and Amanda, have adopted uh, Vidani, I guess is the way you say it, never, or D Dan. And he has all the privileges of the three girls all the love, all the care, everything in that family that the family has to offer, he has the advantage of. That's exactly the picture that he's seeing here. We have, we have all the privileges of those who are children of God because he has brought us in. Uh, he, uh, he has adopted us. In love, he did that. In love, they adopted. Uh, in love, he's done it. But here it's through Jesus Christ to himself. We only get to God through Jesus Christ. Again, it's in Christ or through Christ. He didn't just come out here and say, I'm going to pick that one, that one, that one those who come in Christ or through Christ. Now, he doesn't deal with how we get in Christ in this passage here, but we understand from studying the rest of the New Testament, it is that we get in through Christ through faith. Uh, we get it, and so it's not the predestined is, is being used here that he predetermined how it would be before it ever happened. And then finally, uh, the last line of that, it starts within love and it ends with in his kind intention. God is not a hateful being that's waiting to punish us. That's an important quality we need to see about God. He is a being that's kindly disposed to us. He wants to do good for us. He wants to take care of us. And so because of his purpose and his intention for us, he's going to adopt us as his sons through Jesus Christ. Again, it's through Jesus Christ. It's not, you know, it's, it's not some of the means, but it's through Jesus Christ. Other thoughts uh, uh, down through there. Dempsey? Some things that we wrestle with, and one of the things obviously is the enormity and the depth of that grace. It doesn't seem reasonable, it's too good to be true. But if God says it's true, mm -hmm. by grace we say, in faith, in faith, we need to keep that in mind. There's some things I think we can stand on that. Right. God explained why. He'll say in chapter 220, to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we must be done. And, and uh, according to the power that is working in us, to him be glory in the church. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, created a holy body in his son based on faith. And uh, I'm a part of that, you're a part of that, if you're in Jesus Christ. 
And yeah, there's things I struggle with. And, and you look at your life and you're still struggling with maybe some of those things. But I fall and I get up because of faith. By grace and faith. I fall and I get up because of grace and faith. Grace and faith. And I just keep trusting in that grace and faith. And you know, say by grace and faith. Okay. And and I uh, I think it's so important for us to understand that God is blessing us. It's Him that's doing it, and because of His unlimited and and one of the things I like so much in Ephesians, He never puts a measure on God's power. It's always exceedingly abundantly beyond. You could ever think or imagine that's that's how powerful god is and so there's there's not a limit or a measure put on it other thoughts there okay we're so performance based in our thinking. And we know that we have failed in performance. But God, as you say, we see God is just limitless in what he can do. And, and to appreciate the magnitude of Jesus' sacrifice, we don't, I don't think we comprehend the magnitude of that. And that's what makes all this possible. And you see how you keep saying, in Jesus, through Jesus. He freely bestowed his grace upon us in the beloved. That's what we've been talking about, right? That's what Paul was saying. He's, he's described what he's done. He freely bestowed his grace upon us in the love. Uh, then he breaks into uh, one of these praises. Praise the glory of his grace. I remember I told you one of the words I want you to focus on in the, uh, the book of Ephesians is the word glory. Can you, can anyone give me a real definition of, of what glory is? Or is that one of those words that you can't put your arms around? Uh, is Kelly in the room this morning, Kelly Goble? Uh, he just posted on Facebook a sunset. If anybody are friends with Kelly on face, Facebook and saw that sunset a day or two ago that he posted, that was a absolutely glorious sunset. Don't, don't you think so in seeing the picture? Now, is there any way that you can take words and describe <laughs> the magnitude of what you saw there? I can't. Well, I think that gives us an idea about the, the, the glory of God's grace. It is so magnificent that I can perceive it's there, but I can't describe it. And that's why we struggle. It's glorious. Everything associated with God is glorious. It's undescribable. It's magnificently good. It's magnificently beautiful. It's beyond comprehension. And that's to the praise of the glory of his grace is that he bestowed upon us in the beloved. That's what he's been talking about. It's that glorifies God's grace that he would send Jesus Christ to die for us. Shouldn't that make us appreciate the magnitude? Just God's act of sending Jesus glorifies his grace and his love to us, for us. Other thoughts there? Dan? Yes, sir. I think it's important to go ahead and get on. Uh, several times, Paul has said in Christ, 
Yes. And later on, he says, in Christ, I mean, in the church. Okay. Saying, saying here in verse 6, including freely bestowed on us in the beloved, he's saying, in the church, his grace is forgiven. Okay. And, of course, we, we understand that when you're, when you're added to Christ or put in, or you're in Christ, then he adds you to his congregation. And I like to use the word congregation because that gives us the idea of multiple people. Sometimes the word church gives us a concept of a, of a building or an institution. It's, it's Christ's people. And uh, I thank you, Chris, uh, for, for that idea. And so it's Christ's people are getting together uh, in the congregation. Okay. Okay, let's go to his next thought. In him, again, there's that in him. In him we have redemption. And then he itemizes the things that are uh, there through his blood. That's consistent with the rest of the teaching of the New Testament. Forgiveness of our trespasses. That's what we've been wrestling with is our trespasses. How can I be holy from that? According to the riches of his grace, there's also that uh, undescribable, unbounded quality of God's grace, riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. I like that phrase really well. And I, that reminds me of the two occasions in the Gospels when Jesus uh, fed the, the 5,000, then he fed the 4,000. And I think that shows to me a little bit of uh, when, when Christ does something, he does it bountifully. He fed the, each of those. He starts off with just basically a one-person lunch in both of the feedings. And when he gets done feeding, what does he do in both occasions? What do the disciples do? Okay, and so did he feed them amply? No, he fed them bountifully so that there was more left over than he could ever, than they could ever. And, and that's the, the idea of, he lavished food upon them. That's kind of like, and I don't know if any of you have experienced this but me, but when you were a child and you went to grandma's house, you got hugs and food. More than you could ever need in your life, right? She lavished upon you hugs and food. Well, God has given us more in his grace than we would ever need. He has lavished upon us through the blood of Jesus, forgiveness of our transgressions, according to the riches of his grace, he has poured that on us. And I think the illustration of the feeding the 5,000, 4,000 example illustrates to us how God does. He always has more at his disposal than we'll ever need. Okay, the next thing we see in verse 9 is that he made known the mystery of his will. And uh, I'm going to turn to 2 Corinthians 6 and read Paul's, to me, Paul explains this in 2 Corinthians, uh, the sixth chapter. Uh, beginning and uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians, the second chapter. I was wrong. I'm beginning in verse six. I have written that wrong. Help me out there. First Corinthians, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'll get it right here in a second. First Corinthians 2, beginning of verse 6. He says, yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, or, or we, do, we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. Wisdom, however, not of this age, nor the root of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom and a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have uh, crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, uh, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of man who is, uh, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the, the spirit of God. So this great mystery of how we can be saved is only revealed because of, of God. And it's through insight and wisdom beyond what man could, uh, could know. Uh, it's according to his kind intention. Uh, he purposed it through Christ or in Christ with an administration for, suitable for the fullness of time. I think that in that, that idea, there's a couple of ways we could look at that. If we talk about the fullness of time, everything that has occurred in time since the sin, even before the sin of Adam and Eve, has been working toward our salvation, for, spiritually for us to be saved. And so that is all summed up in Christ. It's not just that everything was in place when Christ came. Everything had been working toward that since before the foundation of the world. That's the fullness of time. Time, the meaning of everything that has occurred has been about our salvation. And I think that's the idea that he's trying to get us to hear. All things are summed up in Christ, things on heaven and earth. Well, we, I was hoping to get through this first section this morning. Uh, we'll we'll pick up here next Sunday morning and finish this first section of the book. I, I do think these individual thoughts are important for us and how they are modified by these amplifying phrases. Thank you.